Hello and welcome to the Medieval Podcast. I'm your special guest host, Peter Konechny. If you're like me, it's an everyday worry whether or not you say the right things, don't make a social faux pas, mind my own manners. So it's not a surprise that people in the Middle Ages wanted to mind their manners as well. To talk about this, we brought in Danielle Sobolski who usually is the host. She has a brand new book that's just about to come out. It's called Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World. So let's explore how the Middle Ages can help teach you better ways to eat, fight, and rule right after this. Hey, Danielle, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on my show. <laughs> good to talk to you, Peter. Good to talk to you too. Wow, I love this position. Brand new book. This is book number... Five. Wow. Wow. So we're pretty excited about this. And I was kind of, you know, reading through it over the last few weeks. And I saw a big parallel with your previous book, How to Live Like a Monk, which was more a look at your inward self. Can you see this book is more directed at the outward part of life? I think that there is a little bit of both in both books. So the monk book is really focused on how to take care of yourself. And then once you take good care of yourself, you can take better care of the world around you. And I mean, I think this is something that is just universal wisdom, which is why medieval monks are saying this and we're still saying it today. With chivalry and courtesy, I think that it's kind of similar in that chivalric virtues, for example, are ones that you need to work on yourself. You really have to take them in and work on them as character traits or ideals that you want to foster. And then the more you lean into this chivalric idea, and ideals, the more that that spills over into the way that you treat other people. And it really is a structure for how to live your life in a way to treat other people better, especially when we're talking about chivalry. I mean, manners are a way to make sure that you are treating other people well and that you're treated well, because they're a really important part of social life. But I think the chivalric aspect of the book is probably closer to the monk book in that it's working on these internal values and these internal qualities so that you can relate to the world in a way that perhaps is more generous or kinder. Indeed, indeed. So you divide this book up into five sections. So we mm -hmm. get how to eat, how to fight, how to run a household, how to rule a kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my favorite is how to woo. <laughs> so yes. why were these the five areas you choose to explore? Well, I wanted to start with how to eat because I think, first of all, when we think about manners, that's what we think about. We think about table manners first, right? When we talk about people getting together in social situations, often we're eating together. So I wanted to start there for two reasons. Number one, that's where we think about manners the most, I think. And number two, that is one of the places where people think that we are furthest apart from the Middle Ages, right? If we watch something on TV, People are just being disgusting at the dinner table and they're throwing stuff on the floor or they're like picking their teeth or picking their nose or like eating off their knives. So I think that's one of the places that in media, especially we highlight the differences between us and the Middle Ages. So I wanted to start there because if you actually look at the sources, there are the same rules for table manners that we have today. Like don't put your elbows on the table. Don't wipe your face on your sleeve. Make sure you're not picking your teeth or doing something disgusting at the table. Share nicely with the people that you're sharing a plate with. So I really wanted to start there because I feel like if you can get people to buy into that and recognize that similarity, then it's much easier to work on the other aspects of culture. So that's why I started there. But when you're talking about culture and manners and stuff like that, it's about human interaction. So not only at the dinner table, but also how to woo, right? So how to court people, those interpersonal relationships in terms of romance, and then like how to raise your children. That's a cultural thing. It has to do with manners. And then how does this relate to kingship? Because a lot of the advice books we have are mirrors for princes, right? And they're aimed at royalty. So I wanted to add all of these things together. And then chivalry, of course, is contained in how to fight as well as the rest of the book. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of these are, you know, the, you're public, you're dealing with others. It goes from the very personal to political, as I said, like when you rule, but you're still having to engage with many people. Yeah. So rulership is not just about the things that you're signing, the documents that you're signing, but it's also about like how you schmooze the ambassador from another kingdom and how you conduct marriages, right? Alliances, things like that. So when you look at a king, I think it's especially relevant when we look at the Middle Ages, because sometimes you have more focused individual power than perhaps we have today. So that interpersonal relationship is based on all the things that I've built up over the course of the book, 
you have to have table manners, you have to know how to fight, you have to know how to woo, you have to know how to run a household in order to run a kingdom. It's very personal, maybe in a way that it's not so much these days. So you chose these five sections, which are also like five sections that people today have a lot of trouble with managing. So, <laughs> But yet a lot of the advice that medieval people are giving doesn't seem really out of place for a modern manual. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking of the grooming tips for a young man, but there's there's a lot of others too. Yeah. So the grooming tips for a young man, this comes from the book of the civilized man, which is written by Daniel of Beckles for, he says, untrained boy clerks. So boys who are being taught how to have good manners while they're in school. And it does say things like, make sure that your hair isn't too long and your beard isn't too long. Make sure you're not picking at lice. You shouldn't have any lice, especially not visible lice, for example. Make sure your nails are clean, that they're not too long. I mean, this is the type of stuff that you find in an employee manual, right? Like, make sure that your shirt oh, yeah. is tucked oh, yeah. in and that your hair is away from the food, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same. Yeah, my partner tells me this all the time. She's like, your nails don't need cleaning. Yeah, um, that's yes, right. Yes, dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have clean nails, especially if you're serving at table. No one wants to see that. And I think that is universal to the human condition. Like nobody wants to see dirty nails at the dinner table. And yeah, it's really similar to what people were writing down back in the day. The Book of Civilized Man was one of the sources you mentioned. And there's others like Machiavelli's, The Prince, The Trotula. Mm -hmm. um, what was the process for you in collecting and like mining this information to create this book? Well, when it comes to a book that's so short, I like to lean on the same sources over and over again so that the people who are reading it get to know these sources pretty well and get to be familiar with who is saying these things. If you're looking for advice from the Middle Ages on how to do anything, you can find it dropped in as little nuggets of wisdom in just about everything that you read. So it can be very hard to keep track of that, right? If you're reading anything, you're finding little nuggets of information. But I wanted to keep consistent sources because, again, I want people to feel familiar with these sources. And so it's then picking which ones are the most illustrative of the point that you're trying to make, the ones that are most clear, the ones that are the most familiar. So even though I could have used the entire book could have just been based on like the writings of Christine de Pizan, for example, because she talks about everything. She writes everything. I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of all the things. And I think when it comes to really basic things like table manners, you do want to go to a source that's something that's aimed at children. So when we're talking about literacy or things like that, you want to go to a source that's aimed at schoolboys. So the book of the civilized men was a good one to take us through the chapter on table manners. This is a really, really excellent book and I've quoted it extensively, but there's so much more to it. So people should check that book out for sure. I can't remember the translators off the top of my head, so we'll have to give you a link to that. But when it comes to things like chivalry, I was picking up people who were actual knights, right? I was picking up the biographies of Boussicault, for example, who is mm -hmm. Marshal of France, William Marshall. I was picking up Ramon Lewis stuff. I was picking up uh, Jean de Bruy stuff, which is Le Juvencel. So as much stuff as I could from actual knights or biographies of knights for that one. I did pick up Machiavelli for the stuff on rulership for a couple of reasons. Number one is he's very familiar to people, right? We know who Machiavelli is yeah. for the most part. But secondly, he's not saying things that are too different from what other people are saying, but he's saying them in a way that's really snappy and cynical. <laughs> so that's fun. He's a fun source to throw in there to give you a little bit of humor because he is so cynical. But again, his, his advice, while it is more cynical and perhaps less kind than the other mirrors for princes, he's not saying things that are remarkably different most of the time. So he was a good source to put in just because he's a fun source and he's so snappy in the way he's writing things. So yeah, I picked Christine de Pizan for other right. things. There are so many good sources from the Middle Ages. There is a wealth of them. Which again, I think goes to show that people are concerned with manners and they're writing about it in the yeah. Middle Ages. Was there a favorite source for you? Something that as you did this research, you came across, oh, this is, this is incredible. I mean, the Book of the Civilized Man is just amazing. I already mentioned that. We've talked about Le Jevoncel before, and that's a really good book too when you're talking about chivalry because it is an advice book for people who are up and coming knights. Yeah. And I didn't get to use that as much as maybe I wanted to in part because I might have overused it when there are other sources for chivalry, especially. 
So those are two of my favorites. There's the Book of the Night of the Tower, which is really good when you're talking about women, right? Because this is a book written by a father for his daughters. And some of his advice is hilarious from this distance, but it probably wasn't for his daughters at the time. Things like, people are going to think that you are flighty if you move your head too much in conversation. So that kind of stuff, very serious back in the day. You know, your dad is trying to make you marriageable, but from this distance, it's pretty funny. So I liked using that source as well. Now, along with your monks book, you're not going in and saying, hey, let's go be monks. I think the same thing applies here. You're not telling people to go out and be knights. Yeah. What's kind of like the game that like you're hoping that the reader's going to get out of this? Well, I'm always just trying to get people more interested in history and recognizing that human element between us all. This is something that medieval podcast listeners are really familiar with because it's something I bang on about pretty much every week. But yeah, this was tricky in some ways because when it comes to the monk book, the ways in which we can care for ourselves and our wellness, our mental wellness, our physical wellness, they're really the same because our physical bodies haven't changed really at all in this short amount of time when we're talking evolutionary terms. But even if we're talking about culture, the things that we do to stay mentally healthy are pretty much the same. It was very tricky in some ways to talk about chivalry in terms of the modern world because there are a lot of aspects to chivalry that are very dark and they are ones that we don't want to take with us. And so I thought it was important to explore medieval chivalry because we need to know the roots of modern chivalry. So today when we talk about modern chivalry, it tends to be the relationships between the, the quote unquote, the two genders, right? Men and women. And when we're talking about the Middle Ages, there's definitely only two genders that they're talking about. So when I'm talking about this in terms of two, I'm talking about this historical context. And when we're talking about chivalry today, it tends to be romantic, right? Is yeah. someone going to open the door for you? That kind of thing. Yeah, Pull yeah, out yeah. your chair. And what, it's important to know the context of this because chivalry back in the day was really aimed at taking care of people that can't take care of themselves. And so in that category fell women because in society, they were thought to be not intellectually strong enough to take care of themselves and not physically strong enough to take care of themselves. So it was a knight's job to step in and be their champion if necessary and lead them and help them however. So when you apply that to today, it can be very tricky because if the implication is that, you know, I'm holding the door for you because you're not strong enough to hold the door for yourself, yeah. it's not very flattering. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's important to know the origins so that we understand where it comes from and how we might accidentally be perhaps reinforcing old gender roles that don't have a place today. So yeah, it was tricky to write that because there are lots of places where I think this particular vision of chivalry from like the 12th century is way out of date. But mm -hmm. then there are other aspects of chivalry like generosity, like caring for other people, like being courageous that definitely we should take into this world. When I kind of come across chivalric manuals, it's often to make yourself, the prestige goes to yourself. The aim is like, Hey, how to improve your lot in life by, you know, taking care of women or children or, or the church and stuff like that. Yeah. But the idea is that you're really just doing it for yourself, right? <laughs> and pump up yourself. And that's not necessarily what we want, you know, people thinking, how can I make myself stand out of the crowd? Yeah, it's a lot about honor and reputation. And so in today's world, if you're looking at concepts like honor and reputation, you have to interrogate them and say, like, what does this mean to you? What is it based upon? And in the 12th century, it's based upon the idea that as man, you're superior. And as a knight, you're superior to everybody, especially if you read Ramon Lul's stuff. It's really about how knights were just born to be better than everyone else, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and look down on others. Some of these texts, pretty cringeworthy stuff that it can write. Yeah, so like Ramon Lull is saying things like, because you're superior to everyone else, you're held to a higher standard. Whereas today, we might be thinking of these are important intrinsic values. Like this is important to just walk this walk because it makes you a better person morally or in the context of society or that kind of stuff. I mean, Jason Kingsley and I were talking about this stuff a couple of weeks ago. People who want to can go back and listen to that episode of the podcast, how he applies these values. But yeah, in the context of medieval knights, many times it is about increasing your reputation. In other ways, it's about getting to heaven. So when we apply chivalry today, you know, we have to look at 
what is our aim here? Why do we want to take on these values? And usually, I think today it could be just because we want to be a better person. And that's yeah. valuable. That's, that's pretty good. Along with the monk's book, there's a lot of interesting things you can think about for yourself. When I was thinking about your chapter on how to woo, first of all, it's coming to me is that this is the hardest part of human relations. Yet the advice is really kind of simple. It kind of breaks down to how to dress, how to impress people. It's not difficult things on their own, but you don't think of it like, especially I don't think of it, how to woo that kind of behavior. And a lot of it, the stuff I found really timeless. Yeah. So when it comes to how to woo, what the basics are is that you should be reading people's body language. And I always find this really interesting. I love reading the work of Joe Navarro, who is an ex-FBI agent who works on body language. And so I dove into his work to see what is similar, because one of, one of the popular articles that you've done, Peter, is on some of the tells, how you can tell a woman is in love. And a good source that I love to look at, even though it's really cringe, is Andreas Capelanus' Art of Courtly Love which is so cringe in so many ways. But I think he talks about that as well. Like, what are some of the tells? How can you tell if a woman is in love? And so I brought some of those into here. I think from Andrea saying a woman might touch her hair more. She might bite her lips more. She might be fluttering her eyelashes type thing. She might be paying more attention to her grooming. So yeah, I looked at Joe Navarro's work to see how can you tell if somebody is into you? And some of the ways are pretty similar. If you start to mirror each other's body language, you start to touch your own face or something like that, that might be an indicator that someone's into you. And at that point, you need to start talking to them. (laughs) And in the Middle Ages, it was a dicey thing because the ideal courtly love is supposed to be adulterous, right? It's supposed to be a woman who's married and she's totally off limits. And yet, as a knight, you're meant to serve her and love her from afar. And the troubadours suggest that you eventually want to get into bed together but most of the time it's just words and it's secretive too yeah and so what words can you use that are not going to offend the lady or her husband but still get across the idea that you want to serve her and when i think about this courtly love hasn't really gone anywhere as much as some of it can be really quite toxic like if you look at the writings of Ulrich von Lichtenstein, the service of ladies even though we're not entirely sure if this is true or if it's fictional. He's basically stalking the woman and it's really quite scary and awful. But there are other aspects to courtly love that are still in existence right now. Even if you look back to like the 90s rom-coms, there's a lot of pursuit that is a little bit cringe now if we look at it. But if you look at song lyrics today and you listen to them, there's often like an unattainable lady and there's a man who really wants to get together with her, but maybe he can't or there's something stopping them and he's just like worshiping her from afar. Like there's a lot of that stuff that's still in modern love oh, yeah. lyrics. Oh yeah, like love is often trying to attain what you cannot attain. Yeah, I mean, some of the troubadours are saying it's an, it's an inborn suffering, right? It is suffering. That might be Andrea saying it. It's suffering. And if you listen to anything like Top 40 today, people are suffering for love. This is a very old idea back to the ancient world. So it's, it's interesting to see that, especially I think when you can see it coming up in the Top 40. And then there's interesting stuff like if you are into someone, If you're a knight and you're into a lady and she's into you, what do you do next? Well, you give her a love token or she will give you one. And these are some of the nicest artifacts I think you can find from the Middle Ages. Like there is a ring that was found on the Towson battlefield. And I think that's one that says basically my heart is yours type thing. There's really nice love tokens. And to find that on a battlefield, I think is significant. The person who had it with them. Yeah. yeah, had it with them and probably died. And so to have that with them in the midst of battle, I think is very significant. Were they actually together? Were they married? Was it a courtly love thing? Was it secret? We don't know. But having these gifts here, I think, is another another cute way of bringing things together. Because when people are in new relationships today, they're like, I want to give this person a gift. What is appropriate? Well, in the Middle Ages, there's a whole list of things which you can find in the oh. book. There are many things that you can do, right? And it's kind of like a mix and match. Mm -hmm. I looked at also the section on rulers. And that's where like a lot of this advice book are aimed at the elite. And there's also this kind of standard that they're held to because they have to do 
a lot of their, their things in public, right? With yeah. crowds around them. And so they have to kind of show piety and leadership. There's just interesting aspects to that. Yeah. It's tricky because when we look at peasants, for example, there isn't really a record of what their manners were meant to be because these are not the people that are writing stuff down, but they are the people yeah. who are teaching their children at home. So their parents are like correcting their table manners every day when they're eating, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you don't have it in the record. Well, we, we do have the Fabio, right? <laughs> Where all the peasants are just terrible, unwashed. Yeah, but is you it know, the peasants that are writing the They're Fabio? not writing it. No, no. no. They're not. <laughs> right. So you have to look at the text and kind of extrapolate from them. So when you look at ones that are for the nobility, because it's usually the nobility who is commissioning and buying these books, then you see the manners that are more clearly laid out. And you're right. Yeah. When you are at a medieval feast and you're a VIP, you're sitting at the top table where everyone can see you. So your manners had better be good because everyone is watching you. So this is the time to make sure that you are not eating off your knife, for example, or picking your nose or anything like that. But you do have to be held to a certain standard. And it is the way to get into rooms that you might not otherwise be getting into. So when we, we talk about Daniel of Beckles, for example, giving advice on manners to children who are learning at school, some of them might be nobility already. But we do know that there are a lot of peasants and commoners that got an education, got a scholarship, and then got to move up in the world. And there's no way that you could move up in the world if you are disgusting at the dinner table or if you're offensive or things like that. Hmm. So learning that stuff is a step stool to get higher up if you're not already there, you know? Someone like this noble is going to be an important individual. They have to set the tone for their peers. All these kind of books are obviously like written with them in mind because they're the ones that are probably paying for it mm -hmm. and can afford it. But it's interesting, like these aspects come down and get thrown to the masses as well, like uh, sent out to the masses where this is, hey, everyone has to follow along on these ideals. Yeah. I mean, I never want to suggest that peasants or people who are at the lowest ranks of society mm -hmm. are just being polite because the nobles are being polite. So I never want to mm -hmm. say that. I think that there's just a standard of decency. People just want to be polite and decent at every level of society. Like it's never just strictly top down. So I want to make that clear at the beginning. That said, if you are sitting in the hall and you're looking at a VIP and they've got excellent manners, this might be something you want to emulate if you haven't seen it before, because you see that sophisticated person doing something sophisticated and you want to emulate. And we do see that there is some emulation in things like material objects. Catherine French, I'm especially thinking of, did a podcast with her about material objects in households. She noticed that when you see a trend being set by, you know, higher up a noble, basically medieval celebrity, that as soon as people start to get their own monetary wealth, they will invest in the same type of things. So mm. Daniel Beckles says you can have a meal without a table, but not without a tablecloth, right? So yeah, you yeah, can have a picnic, but have a tablecloth. So it's the type of thing where if you have next to no money, you might have a tablecloth. The more money you get, you might have linen napkins. And then after that, you might have aqua meals to wash our hands or gamelians, which are basins for washing your hands. And then you'll add that stuff as you have more disposable income. Not because necessarily you see people at the top having this stuff, but because when you have more money, you want to spend it on comfort and cleanliness and mm -hmm. hygiene and all that stuff. But there's a certain amount of social influence that comes from medieval celebrities, of course. Yeah. But I do think that people invest in better linens when they have the money because people like that. They like a nice table and they like to be clean. That's just my oh, humble opinion yeah. on that whole thing. Well, I, I think I think you're quite right. Well, thank you, Peter. That oh. means a lot. <laughs> so we talked about table manners. We talked about how to woo. We haven't really talked much about how to fight. The chapter on how to fight was important because chivalry is not just about fighting, but at its heart, it's about fighting. So I think we needed to establish, or I needed to establish the two aspects. So these days there's this saying, like, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But if you're a medieval knight, you need to be both. So chivalry is derived from cheval, right? It's derived from yeah. horsemanship. So people who are chivalric, by definition, they're knights, they're mounted warriors. And so the warrior aspect of their lives and their culture is essential. You can't have chivalry without knights because that is the heart of it. So 
it was important, I think, to establish what is a knight? What do they do? How do they become knights? And where is their training? And how do they express this knightliness, this martial prowess? So there's tournaments and stuff which really express that chivalric aspect of society. But then the other hand is that most knights have land, right? They have to be able to support their knightly lifestyle, which means money, which means land. So they have to be good administrators. And they have to be good at schmoozing. So they have to actually be quite good on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. They (laughs) They have have to be good in court. They have to be good in court because the other half of the coin, so we're talking about the two genders here, the other half of the coin is you have to be able to get along with ladies. And it's not just because it's good to get married and have children and keep society going, but also because there is this idea around courtly love that Being around ladies is going to inspire you to fight. It's going to increase your prowess, unless you're mooning over someone, in which case your prowess is going down, Andreas Kapalana says. But ladies inspire men to fight. So I have an example in there from William Marshall's biography that talks about these ladies were at a tournament and they had a little dance party before the tournament started and they inspired the English knights to fight so well that they Uh. obliterated everyone. So that's down to ladies. So you have to be a fighter and you have to be a lover. If you're going to be a knight, it's all of these things, chivalry is all of these things wrapped up. Yeah, I I guess we don't realize how public the act of fighting is. At times you're fighting with your companions, right? So Mm -hmm. you have that. But then the tournament aspect of that, that becomes just like a stage, really where you're showing yourself off, right? And like a lot of the kind of sources that you wrote on, are like focused on, hey, I went to this tournament and I did this and I did this and I did this. Mm-hmm. And and then the actual, you know, wars are glossed over, right? Like, so that mm-hmm. that was the important part for some of these knights was to be involved in tournaments as opposed to actually being a warrior for warrior's sake. Tournaments were really important, not just for the fact that you are practicing your martial prowess under duress, especially at the beginning of the tournament culture when it was mostly about the melee instead of the joust so that you have a mock battle all these knights fighting for each other and ransoming each other like taking each other hostage and then ransoming so there's a lot that's going on at the tournament that's kind of under the radar when we think of it as being a pageant then you know you have your knights that you cheer for and stuff Mm -hmm. but a knight in a tournament is learning about his own fighting style and other people's fighting styles. And these are going to be people that they either fight with or against in the future. So there's a lot of learning there. And then when it comes to hostages, you're learning about the valuation of things, right? So if you're a hostage, usually your ransom is your horse. So you lose your destrier, which is just so painful. What a painful loss. It's expensive, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you probably have a bond with this horse and it's super expensive, like race car expensive. And just so valuable in its training. Anyway, you lose your horse as part of ransom. And then all these knights are not going to necessarily keep all these destriers, they're going to sell them. So you have ideas of the valuation of objects and people and rank. And there's just so much going on at a tournament that is training a knight up. That is, like I was saying, it's kind of under the radar when we just think of them as like getting points in a tournament or winning or going to war. There's a lot that's happening that is kind of invisible. Yeah, there's the the lessons of these this part of chivalry isn't the military value, it's the social value. Yeah, and the tournament really brings out both. This is not something that I see talked about very much in the sources or or in secondary sources, but I think that taking the measure of the other knights mm-hmm. that you might be fighting against later is so important when you're trying to come up with strategies because we're talking about humans that are creating strategies in order to defeat other humans to see these people in action is to understand how they fight and what their weaknesses are perhaps yeah to know them better and the way you know someone is through a social setting you can't know a person on the other side of the battlefield you have to know them before you know them better at the dinner table than you will at any other place and it's good training now that you mention it it's good training to go and fight somebody on the battlefield in a mock battle and then still have the emotional maturity to sit mm-hmm. down with that person at the table and not take it out on them later <laughs> you know like yeah. there's there's a lot of emotional maturity that's happening in the tournament as well 
Yeah, and not just even fighting against, but fighting with them. When you go to war, you really, especially in medieval where it's very close combat, you really have to depend on the person next to you. That's right. So, so there's a lot of training. And this is an opportunity for people who might be from different counties to work together and team up and see how it works. And then if you're somebody who's later going to be a commander, you can see, oh, these guys did not work well together. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we shouldn't put them together. I think that the interpersonal relationships, as you're saying, are a big part of warfare. And uh, they're not something that tends to get chronicled all that much. So the last chapter that we haven't really touched on is how to run a household. A lot of these sources, they come from men. Like we have the good man of Paris that is telling his wife, his much younger wife, this is how, how it's being done. But how were you able to put that into, hey, this is, we also have to take the women's perspective. I thought it was important to bring up the good men of Paris because his whole book is on how to be a good wife. And I think mm. it's really valuable to have a man's perspective on how to be a good wife. Mm. And people who read the book will see it is the 1950s housewife's manual, right? Like it's literally bring him his slippers in front of a roaring fire. And that's amazing because it, it makes me laugh. It is the good man's idea. And when he talks about the wife's duties, he's like, your only duty is really to care for your husband, which is no problem. It's easy. You yeah. have servants and stuff. By the way, here are all the things you need to know. And it's like another hundred pages of all the things you need to know to be a good wife. So it just goes to show that there is quite a lot that a woman needs to do and keep track of and keep a hold of when she's running a household. Then you look at Christine de Pizan, who is what you might want to call a proto-feminist in that she really believes that women are just about equal. She's a very devout Christian, so she never really thinks that women are fundamentally mm -hmm. equal because of Genesis. But she talks about how you need to support your husband. You need to be with him forever. You can't really leave him, even though he might be a terrible person. And so I thought it was important to look at Christine because she's recognizing that some husbands are terrible what can you possibly do about it and she thinks you should suffer through we do know from looking at other examples ruth mazo Karras gets into that when she's talking about marriage and her work and then also bridget wells furby who talks about lucy de Thwing. you know that's a woman who just left her husband and lived with another one so we know mm -hmm. that you know yeah there are ideals and then there are the ways that people actually live but when we're talking about culture, it's important to look at what the ideals are and then see how people went around them. So the good man's ideals are like, it's easy to take care of your husband. And Christine's yeah. saying, you should be taking care of your husband, despite the fact that sometimes it's very challenging to do so. And then there's other sources I have that give advice to people who are getting into marriage. And I think it was worthwhile to put in a poem that I found in Eve Salisbury's team's book, The Trials and Joys of Marriage. It's a poem called How the Good Man Taught His Son. And he talks about how even though a man has a legal right to discipline his wife physically, that it's better not to do that because he's seen, he says, he's seen lots of examples where this is bad. Instead, you should be treating your wife as an equal because she is he says even though she is in some ways a servant to you she's also in some ways a fellow to you so i thought it was important to bring all of these things in when we're talking about marriage because it is one of these social aspects still around today that has so much complexity in it yeah it's, it's so tricky i can see there's like diverse views even in the middle ages isn't there also a women's guide to her daughter at the same time yeah, that one has all sorts of interesting stuff in that as well. It's not too different from the stuff that we see otherwise. Be good to your husband, treat him with respect. It's not too different. It's one of the things that I quote in a different part of that chapter that's talking about how to raise children that says, mothers, you need to make sure that your daughters get married off early because otherwise they might get into trouble. <laughs> I think I use that more for the part about raising your children. Yeah, the, the raising the children is, again, that thing that everyone gets advice on. Mm -hmm. yeah, we all probably do need advice, but we all get lots of advice. <laughs> this is Peter saying this as a parent himself. Yeah, I mean, we all need a lot of advice, and we are often given a lot of unsolicited advice. When you show up in the park with a stroller, everyone comes <laughs> out of the woodwork with advice for you. And the part that I really wanted to pull out 
for this book, for that chapter, was the fact that there are a lot of people in the Middle Ages that are raising children that are not biologically theirs. So you will have a lot of children that are biologically yours in the Middle Ages, in part because, I mean, that's just how it is, in part because they don't have reliable birth control, even though mm -hmm. they do try to have birth control. So you have a lot of biological children, and hopefully they survive. But you might have a lot of other children that are not yours. Some of them, you might be taking in a relative's children if the parents have died, for example. You might be taking in a relative's children because you're fostering them. If you are mm -hmm. noble, you might be taking them in to raise them to be a good chatelaine or to raise them to be a good knight. Uh, you might be taking in children if you remarry. You might be taking in stepchildren that way. Mm -hmm. And then you will also have a lot of young people in your house, no matter what area of society you're from, unless you're at the very, very bottom, who are servants. Because a lot of teenagers train up as servants to learn how to run a household and to make money before they set up their own household. So you might have a whole lot of kids in your house that are not yours. And so I thought it was important to recognize that as something that is very different from today, where we're usually just raising the children that are biologically ours or the children that we've adopted as ours. But there's not nearly as much movement of children as there was back in the day. Yeah, I was just reading a piece about this 15th century English lady who has among her household staff, she has these proto-knights. These are mm -hmm. gendry, and they're treated differently from the other servants, right? And their mm -hmm. idea is to be with her and be personal attendants, but also be at the parties. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If you're coming up to be a knight, you are serving the people who you're living with. You're serving at table. This is part of your training to be a knight. And it's a great system if you are in the Middle Ages because you have these servants who are going to be doing their best to impress you and be genteel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you're serving at table, you definitely get a close look at who has good table manners and who you want to emulate. So it's an interesting system. Yeah, exactly. Well, they didn't have to do the regular chores. There's the servants that have to go off and get the uh, lost pig. They have a different path in life. And yet, these are all children under the same roof. So how do you raise them? Right. Well, yeah. this is something that there is a lot of advice on, as you say. I'm really glad you got a chance to write this two-parter books, The Inward and the Outward Life. Congratulations on a brand new book, and thanks for being my guest. Thank you. You can find Danielle on her website at daniellesobolski.com, as well as on Twitter at 5MINMedievalist, as well as other social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Blue Sky. Her latest book is Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World. It's about to come out from Abbeville Press. Normally at this time, we would be joined by Peter from Medievalist.net to talk about what's on the website. But that Peter is me. And since it would be awkward to talk with myself, we would just say, go check out Medievalist.net for more good stuff. A big thank you to everyone who's supporting this podcast and everything else at Medievalist.net through our Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of awesome stuff, including the Book of the Month Club and ad free access to this podcast where all the hard hitting questions are asked. Indeed. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Fraud. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.